Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm going to get us started now. Uh, welcome to the first in the series we're calling Dismantling Structural Racism. I'm Tom Landon, the director of the McFarland Center for Religion, Ethics, and Culture at the College of the Holy Cross. And I'm hosting the three events in this series, which begin today with uh, an event featuring Malik Neal, the class of 13, on bail reform and his work with the Philadelphia Bail Fund, which he co-founded. Uh, this time next week, we'll have an opportunity to speak to Rashonda Tyson of the class of 04 about improving educational opportunities for black and, brown, black and brown students at the primary and secondary levels. And then a week later, we'll get to talk to Jerry Dickinson of the class of 09 on the impact of housing policy on black and brown people. These are really three, uh, to my mind, remarkable young alumni who Holy Cross has tremendous reason to be really proud of. Um, we'll record these discussions and make them online for a larger audience uh, in the future at the end of the series. I'm glad to have a great turnout that people signed up. I want to welcome students uh, from the incoming class of 2024 uh, and from the other classes and the faculty, staff, and others. Welcome Malik and his uh, Philly Bail Fund colleague, Dante Jones. We had a little bit of trouble with video, so Dante is with us on, on audio. I'd say there are really few times in history when we get a moment when people are mobilized to make real change. But right now, I think we are living in one of those moments when the possibilities for change are at least accelerated. I think it's also clear, um, our guest is a history major, we were talking about that, he knows history as well as I do, that uh, people have short memories and they've been distracted away many times before by different kinds of concerns. And we know that there are a lot of forces who have a stake in working to distract us from the kind of changes that we know that we need. I've been trying to think about what it takes to channel the willpower of the alumni of the, of the moment, I'm sorry, into lasting sustainable change uh, and thought of these three alumni presenters who are already working to bring about that sort of change. Uh, this event, like most that we do, specifically has Holy Cross students in mind uh, to learn from the alums about how you can bring about change. So even in July, while the momentum is strong and we're usually uh, vacationing or doing something else, I'm hoping that we can chart, harness what the alums know and build upon the momentum of the moment momentum that I want to say is possible only because of tragic deaths like George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and uh, many others. Um, I've known of and admired Malik's work uh, with Philadelphia Bail Fund uh, for a couple of years now, uh, which made him an obvious choice to do this. And I'm grateful that Dante uh, has agreed to join him. Uh, Malik and I agreed that we would try this as an interview format. So we'll work to make sure that we have time for questions after that, particularly for students. And uh, we'd ask people to use the Q&A function for that. Uh, I'd say early on, you might save your questions um, unless you have some that need, I require clarification. And then I'll just bring those up to uh, Malik uh, or Malik and Dante. So I'll ask uh, maybe both of you begin with Malik and just ask uh, if there's anything you wanna tell us about yourselves uh, and about how each of you got involved with uh, uh, bail reform and the Philadelphia Bail Fund. Malik, if you want to start. Yeah, happy to start. And thank you, Tom, for the invitation. And it's, I was going to say it's good to be back at Holy Cross, but I guess we're not there, but virtually. Um, yeah, I think my involvement uh, in the bail abolition movement, as we call it, uh, actually began at Holy Cross, ironically. Um, and so in 2010, um, you know, I was uh, leaving class at Holy Cross and I got a call uh, from my mom at the time that uh, my father had been arrested. Um, and um, at the time he had saw a judge, he was arrested on his way back from, from work and um, saw a judge and he was assigned a bail that uh, neither me or, or my family could afford. Um, and so at that time it was a real, um, it was a, a traumatic moment, but it also opened my eyes to the real injustices of the system. And in my father's case, um, the case was eventually withdrawn and dismissed uh, some time later, but that was time that, that me or our, and my family could never get back. And so after that experience, I spent about five years uh, volunteering in the Philadelphia jails. Uh, and actually my job as a volunteer was only to listen and document complaints in the jail. Um, and so for years, I 
you know, listen to complaints about excessive force, about people being denied medical care, um, about assaults and rapes within the jails. Um, and one of the things that I found as I was talking with people is that a lot of the people I spoke with was actually there just because they couldn't come up with the money to get home. And so I think it was really the, the culmination of those two experiences that led me in 2017 with a, a couple of friends here in Philadelphia um, to start the bail fund. Um, and for me, it was primarily so that I could prevent what had happened to me and my family, but also to make sure that no one was exposed to the type of um, violence that I had uh, witnessed and listened to in the jails. Um, and so started the bail fund in 2017 and uh, this May we've uh, we celebrated three years. Dante, would you just tell us uh, uh, anything you want to tell us about yourself and how you got involved with the Philly Bail Fund and maybe try and speak loud if you can. Okay, um, so a quick background on my story. Um, about two years ago, um, I was arrested um, and charged with a number of crimes, which I didn't commit. Um, they were possession, manufacturing, distribution, and all that happened without me having one drug on. Um, a police officer told me he was going to make my life hell, and that's what he did. Uh, he arrested me on, I believe it was the 28th. I made ROR. I came home on the 29th. He arrested me again on the 29th and charged me with the same exact charge. Wow. So you met the Phil you met the Philly Bell Fund at that moment? At that moment I became associated with Malik and the Philly Bell Fund. Actually a funny story how that happened. Um I was in jail and I had an aunt who was watching Dateline and there was a story about people who needed bail. And she went on the website and it referred her to a north location, which was Malik and the Philly Bell Fund and I believe about 12 hours after that, um, the bail fund had posted bail for him. And I was on my way home, not knowing who posted bail or who Malik was, but I saw his name at the bottom of my bail fund slip, which uh, I found kind of disturbing at the time, to be honest. About his name. <laughs> but uh, it actually turned out to be a great thing for me because um, since then, um, I went on to... Uh, it took about a year. I went through that case, and all charges were dismissed. And, um, you know, without the bail fund, I would have sat in jail the entire time over the course of that year, waiting to fight the case for something I didn't do. So the bail fund really made a big difference in my life. And um, that's why I'm here today, um, to support the bail fund. But I can tell my story as many times as I have to. Wow, thank you. Um, maybe Malik, if you can say something about how the bail system is supposed to work. I mean, it's been around centuries. I imagine for a lot of people, it seems unobjectionable, sensible. Um, so tell us how it's supposed to work and then maybe what, what's wrong with bail. And that, I'll let both of you tell what's wrong with bail. Yeah. Yeah, I'll start, and Dante, certainly uh, feel free to jump in. But I think to understand money bail, I think it's probably important to just understand the, the scope and scale of the problem. And so, you know, as we talk now, um, there's about half a million people sitting in jails across the country. Um, and by jails, jails, not prisons. Jails, not prisons. So the distinction is that jails are norm prisons are people for than sentenced for a considerable amount of time. Jail normally hosts people pre-trial. Um, so right now we have about half a million people sitting in jails, you know, confined to pre-trial detention, um, haven't been convicted of no crime, but just an inability to, to pay for their freedom. Uh, and the reason that is, is that the vast majority of the people that our criminal legal system arrests, punishes, um, puts in jail um, are poor. Um, and so in cities across the country, what determines whether or not, you know, a person goes to jail or gets to go home with her family is the amount of money they can come up with. 
Um, so how it works generally is you're arrested, and I think Dante's example is really helpful. Um, you're arrested, you know, a judge reads your charges, and basically what they say is that, you know, you're allowed to go home anytime you want if you come up with this certain amount of money um, that we've decided that you have to pay based on a chart um, in your charges. And so if you don't have the $500,000 um, the lowest bail we pay for the Philly bail fund is $30. Um, and so if you don't have that amount of money, then you go to jail to await trial. Uh, and in Philadelphia, the amount of time it takes for a trial, the average is about 160 days. Um, and so, I mean, I think Dante's example is really um, important. And I think, you know, yesterday, for example, we marked the fifth year um, anniversary of the death of Sandra Bland, um, who many people have, um, her story has really uh, moved a lot of people. But I mean, here is a lady who was 28 years old, was, was working um, and had a traffic stop and gotten an altercation with an officer, was sent to jail because she couldn't pay $500. Um, and I mean, as, as many people know, because of the real trauma that jails are. Um, unfortunately, she committed suicide three, three days um, later after being in the jail in Dallas. Um, and so I think, the, I think that example um, really illustrates um, just the traumatic experience and that can happen, but also I think it highlights just the general problem when you have a system that is entirely based on money because then you're gonna have enormous disparities and it wind up criminalizing uh, poverty. Dante, anything you wanna to add to that? Oh yeah, like I can say, um, so with my particular situation, um, when that, initially the judge sentenced me to a $50,000 bail and um, his reasoning was, I just saw this guy last night and that's what he said. So I just released him last night, and he's here again, $50,000 bail. And for me, I had an, um, a, a public defender there who said, Your Honor, this guy has never been convicted of a crime. He has no criminal record, and you're going to give him a $50,000 bail? And he responded by saying, I just saw him last night. And it was reduced down to 25000 which ended up being 2,500, but for me, it might as well have been 25 million because I couldn't come up with that money. And um, a little bit of background on that story, you know, during that particular time, um, I was in transition, um, me and my girlfriend, we had just lost our home and we were about maybe six or seven days away from moving into our current home now where we're at. And had I not been home, I wouldn't have this home because everything was in my name. And so right then and there, you know, you know, you're willing to make so many sacrifices. I see it all the time where people take the deal because you don't see a way that you're going to make it home anytime soon without taking the deal. And what happens is you get so many people convicted of crime they didn't commit because there's no light there. You don't know when you're going to see a judge. You don't know when you're going to get out. And there's this fear that if you don't take the deal and you fight the charges and you lose, you'll get the maximum sentence. You know, I remember the first thing the attorney said to me was, um, I've seen many innocent people go to jail here in this building, referring to a courthouse. And um, that was his way of discouraging me from fighting my yeah, that's the first thing my lawyer told me, which was crazy. And I told him, well, we're going to fight this one. And, um, you know, without the bail fund there, you know, I might not have had that same conviction. You know, it makes a big difference when you're free and you have the ability to gather witnesses and interview attorneys and do things to prepare yourself for a case as opposed to sitting in a, in a room, not knowing what's going on, and then suddenly you're in a courtroom one day with someone who you don't even know defending you, who knows nothing about your case, who says to you, is there anything you want to say? And so when I hear a story about Sandra Brown, I, I, 
I understand. Like it's a whole mental, it's a whole mental job to help those. You know, it's not just that you're separated away from the streets, from your family, from your employment, all those things you need to not fall apart for you to have a successful life. And you find yourself in a cell one day, whether it's for something you did or something you didn't do. And the only, the only thing there between you and going back and carrying on your life is a couple dollars. And, you know, how the system structured that someone who has more money than me gets to go on with life regardless of whether he did it or not. And I don't because I don't have money. That's a, it, it's just, it makes no sense. It makes no sense. If I, I say this all the time. If what I did was too bad for me to be on the streets, then why is it okay five or a thousand dollars later? Now it's okay to let me out. Now I'm not a I'm not a problem to society if I have a thousand dollars. But otherwise, you need to keep me locked away. And you know that's the problem with the system right there. That you know, based upon how much money you have in your pocket, determines whether the system sees you as being a viable member of society or not. And so, like, I know that, like, it changed my life, the fact that I was able to come home, the fact that I was able to get my housing, I was able to bring my family off the streets, I was able to continue working and go forward. And I, I get to be where I am today, and that's talking about bail, I'm talking about bail reform, instead of maybe sitting in a judge uh, in a cell in a cell or even now being home with a felony on my jacket for something I didn't even do you know so it, 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 it's a big thing it's a huge thing I agree let me ask because you mentioned I'm picturing maybe people are picturing uh, you mentioned uh, judge and public defender and all um, you know I think I've heard Malik say elsewhere um, um, you, you imagine a courtroom full of people and due process being followed and the like. And I think I've heard Malik say elsewhere that most of these cases happen in less time than it took me to do the introduction to this talk. Is that, tell me, what's the process really like? So, Either um, you. you're right. Yeah. Can you hear me? Can everybody hear sure. me? Okay, yeah. So what happens is once you're arrested, um, the police officer themselves have the, they, they have the privilege, I guess, of deciding what charges you're charged with. And um, it doesn't matter whether you did them or not. It doesn't matter whether they can stick. At that point, it's just the police officer and what he says and what he puts down on that paper of what charges you're initially charged with. And once you're thrown in a cell, you come out and you step into a small room and there's no crowd, there's nothing. There's a screen in front of you a television screen and a camera. And on the lower end of the screen is a defender, and on the big screen is a, a bail commission. And at that moment, you find out what you're being charged with. And, um, you know, these officers have a, uh, a lot of the tactics they use. Is they, they give you the, the biggest and the, the, the worst charges they can possibly put on you. Whether it's going to stick at court or not, it's not the concern for them. What they do is they, they find the most vile things they can charge you with so that when that commissioner hears what you're charged with, then he gives you an appropriate bail to those charges. So it doesn't matter what you did. It only matters what it says. And at that point, the commissioner says, okay, you're charged with this, you're charged with that, you're charged with this. An appropriate bail will be $50,000. And then you're hustled back to yourself. And that's how it happens. Yeah, there's no big crowd. There's two people in the video camera. And, you know, police officers are, you know, they're keeping the peace or they're they're out there to, to combat crime. But they're not qualified to, to come up with appropriate charges for people they detain. And unfortunately, they're given that power. And it's often abused. I know in Philadelphia, a big tactic is, um, you know, what they call, they say it's the revolving door. So they say people are getting charged with drugs, and they're coming right back out. And one of the tactics they use nowadays is to charge you with really large, heavy drug charges to ensure that you'll sit 
for a minute as opposed to coming right back out. And that's where the bail comes in. When you give those those those, uh, those officers do, those charges would never stick again. But it didn't matter. See, once they were, once I was accused, that's when the bail system came in. And I was supposed to never make bail. And, and that was their hope. And fortunately for me, you know, the bail fund. And so even though those charges were levied against me, I made bail. I was able to come home. I was able to fight them. And I was able to hold my ground until they were dismissed. Yeah. Because I had support. Um, I, I had somebody financially support me. Not only in just the bail fund didn't just pay my bail. Every court case after that. They sent me an Uber to come to court because they know that missing one court date and everything changed. So, you know, that whole process, that whole system, you know, to be able to charge me with that litany of crime for something I didn't even do. And I wouldn't get my day in court. Well, yeah, I think at least at 160. For me, it was over 365 before I had a chance to defend myself in front of a judge. And, you know, fortunately, justice was done in that case and all charges were dismissed. But, you know, had there not been a bail fund, you know, me worrying about my family and worrying about whether I'm going to have a house, I could have been compelled to say, hey, you know what, I'll take some minor charges if you're going to let me go home. Because I have to weigh, you know, the interest of justice against the good of my family. And I shouldn't have to do that because I don't have five hundred or five thousand dollars. So, thank you, Dante uh, Malik. Can you say maybe a little bit more about consequences for? We know some of the consequences, perhaps for Dante, but what are the consequences we're not thinking about uh, when someone is charged, has bail, or can't make bail and is stuck in jail? So, I mean, there's been a. a, a, a body of research, you know, on the harms of bail. And I think for the Philly Bail Fund, we really try to intervene as soon as we can, um, only because the research shows that just three days incarcerated, you're at a heightened risk of losing your job, um, losing housing, um, employment. Um, and so uh, we really try to intervene as soon as possible to try to prevent those sort of collateral consequences. But I think Dante kind of hit at a point that's also really important because if you can't make bail, um, the research shows that you're nine times more likely to plead guilty. Um, and that oftentimes it results in longer sentencing if you're held in on bail. And the, and the reason for the, the pleading guilty um, is ultimately if you can't pay bail, um, the prosecutor would say, look, you know, Dante or whoever, uh, you can come home, you know, if you just plead guilty to this this crime, um, even if you didn't commit it. Um, and, you know, a lot of people take that choice. Um, and I think, I mean, they do it obviously because they want to be home, but the problem is then you're left with, you know, a criminal record that will follow you for the rest of your life. life. Um, I also think that once you are incarcerated, uh, you're not able to really fight your case from home and be in contact with your lawyers. And so we've bailed out um, so far since we started, I think we bailed out about 450 people in Philadelphia. Um, and last year we did a study sort of just on the cases that resolved that we bailed out. Um, and shockingly of the cases that resolve, 70% resolved in dismissal before trial, right? Which is pretty amazing because you think many of those folks likely would have pled guilty if they um, were incarcerated. Um, and so we have so many people going through the system, right? The only way the system can adequately, adequately deal with it is to um, coerce people into these guilty pleas because then you don't have to go to trial and you don't have to go through that whole process. And so- um, all How many people a day or a week would that be in Philadelphia for bail? Yeah, so I mean, it, it, right now in Philadelphia, um, we have, I think, a, a little over um, a thousand people uh, in on bail. Uh, there are other holds, um, but that's just the population now. But if you think about it, each day there are people going through, right, who 
um, can't afford to pay. And unfortunately, some families do have to put the money together to pay and they're able to be released. And I say unfortunate because they shouldn't have to. Um, but I think ultimately though, you know, and there's been a lot of litigation across the country that says that actually bail is unconstitutional because you're violating people's due process and equal protection, right? Because if you are held on bail, um, then ultimately it has implications not only on your life, but on, you know, your, your case. Um, I don't know if you had other, I, I stopped you, but whether you had other consequences that I made you skip over when I was asking you about the number, but. Um, let me ask a question. Your website, I noticed, says that the criminal legal system is, quote, a trusted tool of white supremacy, which is a pretty powerful, uh, damning statement. Can you help us out with what that means? Um, many people might find that kind of hard to hard to deal with. So uh, is it just a problem of bad action by judges or some cops who overcharge people? So what, what makes this a, a structural tool of white supremacy? Yeah, I actually haven't looked at our website in some time. But, um, but I think the point that I believe we were trying to make, right? You know, oftentimes I think we hear this notion that our criminal justice system is uh, broken. And I think what we're trying to get at is that that's actually fundamentally misguided. Um, I, you know, I happen to think words are important. And so even when we talk about criminal justice, I, I actually rarely refer to it as a criminal justice system. I often refer to the criminal legal system or criminal punishment system. And I think I, I do that because I, I, I never want to give off the implication that the system actually is interested in justice, right? And so I think if you believe that the point of the system is to promote human flourishing, to promote equality, to even promote public safety, then I think, yeah, I mean, the system is broken. But if you believe that it's, it's, its goals and aims and purposes are quite different, right? To um, control, to surveil, uh, to protect sort of um, power hierarchies and structurally racist policies. Then I think the system is actually working quite effectively, right? Your bureaucracy manages to take 12 million people each year away from their families' homes and put them into these um, government run cages. But I think we know, for example, and there's been a lot of research that, you know, there are more people in jail and under surveillance, more black men uh, in jail or under surveillance than were enslaved in 1850. Um, and we know that once you are convicted, you have the same type of discriminations, uh, denial of civil rights, employment, you know, those suddenly become real uh, and legal, actually. Um, and Right now, the Bureau of Justice Statistics says that if you are a black baby, um, you have a one in three chance of being in jail or prison, right? And so I think trying to understand those sort of larger structural problems, you know, I often say, actually, you know, I grew up in the inner city of Philadelphia, still live there. But actually, the most crime-ridden environment I've ever been in was Holy Cross, actually. Um, and I'm not, this is not a knock at Holy Cross, but college campuses, if you think about every weekend, there's like mass lawlessness in college campuses. But how we respond to that is quite differently than you would respond to it in the poorest neighborhoods of Worcester. Um, in Philadelphia, in, you know, in Chicago, in New York, I was thinking about this earlier, like it's illegal to like wager with dice. You know, if you're on the street wagering dice, you could be arrested for that. But we have a whole system where people actually make a living out of like betting on mortgages, betting on food supplies, betting on healthcare. Um, but if you, for one, you know, you could be jailed and for other, you know, you could have a college building named after you, right? And so I think trying to understand those sort of larger structural um, uh, problems and how our current system doesn't challenge those problems, but actually in those hierarchies and those sort of structurally, uh, the structure of racism within our system, but it actually maintains that status quo. And I think that's um, what we're trying to get at. Um, and so it's not a matter of individual judges. It's not a matter of sort of racial bias training. Uh, it's, the problem is actually the system itself. So if someone said to me, this is about preventing violence and keeping uh, violent people 
off the street. Uh, Dante already had a fairly good answer to me about that in terms of saying that uh, if it's about violence, then why can someone else buy his way out? But is, is this about uh, preventing violence and helping poor people in their neighborhoods? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I mean, I think I'll say a couple of things. One is I think Dante touched on this, right? Um, you know, I mean, think about this. I mean, we live in a world where Dante, for example, was in jail for a week because he couldn't pay, you know, $25,000 uh, or $2,500, sorry. Um, but we also live in a world where Harvey Weinstein gets to pay $2 million and come home, right? So, I mean, the system in that, in that sort of, um, you know, and like I said, we paid $30 for a bail, right? To me, that's not a system that is interested um, in actually preventing violence. But I also think, and this is one thing I've sort of become aware of working um, in this bill, that I think we also have to just fundamentally uh, have a broader understanding of violence, right? Um, I used to be, a, um, I used to teach time ago, I was a horrible teacher, um, just because, you know, I think I put the kids to sleep. But um, the, the school I worked in had so, I mean, it was under-resourced, there was asbestos in the school, right? Like, to me, that is a form of violence, actually. I, I mean, I would classify that as that. Um, when you have people in, this, in, in Philadelphia going to bed, um, hungry, uh, homelessness. Um, I think to me, those are, that is violence that um, also needs to be addressed. And so I think ultimately, um, if we are interested in really getting that violence, one, I don't think bail actually um, addresses that, but I think we also need to have a broader conversation of what actually prevents violence. Um, and if incarceration prevent, prevented violence, um, then the United States would be the safest country in the world. And it's not. So would you advocate getting rid of bail altogether? Are there ways you can do this? Do you have alternatives to that? So um, I think one is sort of a general principle and we actually have examples. And so, I mean, ultimately what uh, in, you know, organizations that are fighting for the end of bail are, are really fighting for is the presumption of innocence um, that we, our country, you know, at least on paper, believes in, right? And so people can be charged with a crime, but they should be able to uh, be home and fight their cases like everyone else. Um, we have a couple of jurisdictions where there is no bail. So Washington, D.C., for example, got rid of bail in the 1990s. So there's no bail. And essentially what happens in, in D.C. is, I believe, a, a, over 90% of the people who are charged go home. Um, there's a very small subset of people um, where there's an actual detention hearing where the prosecutor has to prove that this person really is a, um, a, uh, an unmanageable risk to the public. And those people are detained. I think in, in DC it's about 6%. Um, so, I mean, that is a system that, you know, we have now in Washington, DC, um, New Jersey, couple years ago, just ended cash bail. Um, so I think it would be just that basic principle of um, innocent until proven guilty. And we actually have models across the country to do that. I think the challenge now is not necessarily how we get there, but ultimately I think it's a question of uh, political will. Oh. Let me ask you two questions and I'm gonna open it up to, to the group and uh, one is, uh, whatever gave you the idea that you could build this from scratch? Um, how, how'd you go about it, you and your co-founders? Was it, was it, uh, do you look back and say, we were lucky? You have something, you have a pretty ambitious task. So what made you believe you could do it? Uh, you know, I don't think I believed I can do it until I start doing it, I guess. Um, but I would say that one of the things about a, a bail fund, and maybe we didn't mention this before, um, is that the end of a case, when a person's case is over, all those funds come back to the bail fund, right? So it's a revolving fund in that sense. We pay bail, a person goes to court, um, and then those funds come back. Um, but, you know, I think I just found people who are also um, committed to this. And I, I think 
we spent about a year just planning and like we need to get a hundred everything a hundred percent right and then eventually we just said okay we're just going to post bail um and see how it goes and i'm not suggesting anyone do that but I, but i don't think i ever envisioned that i'd be doing this and i never envisioned that it would you know um be um as effective as it is now i think that was a gradual uh, process and i'm still every day um learning more and and still shocked sometimes. Dante, go ahead. Were you going to say? I know when he bailed me out, I, I asked him, how do you choose the people that you bail out? You know, I said, uh, what crimes do you bail out? And I was wondering why they bailed me out. And I know his answer is, he's not a judge. He's not, a, he's not going to randomly choose people. He's going to bail people out bail. And I thought that was a very broad mind, you know, because I was sitting there thinking uh, that maybe he was decided I wasn't first. And I was going to say earlier, you know, the thing about how you fix this problem, you know, um, you know I think once you remove past bail, period, there's going to also have to be a bigger, a bigger process. You're going to have to have people, I mean, there are places where there's no cash bail, where they just lock everybody. You know, if nobody's getting bailed, then just, you know, and then that fight against the whole kind of So there's no easy answer, but I think you do know that the way the system is set right now, it doesn't. Yeah. Let me ask, I have one question I'll save for the end a little bit, but um, uh, Mitchell Baker asks, in your opinions, how do we convince people who haven't experienced the injustices of the justice legal system or who don't know someone personally affected by such injustices to join the movement to correct such issues like bail reform, policy reform, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things, um, you know, so every time now when I go to a place, and this is a really weird thing I do, um, but I actually go and watch bail hearings, which is like odd. So, you know, I was in New York, for example, and I just wanted to see how that system worked. Um, and I ultimately think that type of exposure is very important. So one of the things we do in the Philly Bail Fund, we have a court watch program where we bring, so far we had about 250 people come in to watch bail hearings. And I think it's a, you know, and we have people write reflections of what they saw. And to me, I found that to be like a really eye-opening experience for people because I think if anyone watches a bail hearing, and by the way, I don't think Dante mentioned this, but in Philadelphia, we just sued the courts because the bell hearings are completely off record. So there's not even a record cap, right? So you have two minute hearings where a person's liberty is at stake and it just flies by. Um, and I think for anyone who sees that, I think they begin to see um, this sort of assembly line system and, and you know, the faults within. Uh, so I think having that type of um, exposure is important. And, and also, I mean, maybe it's a history major me, but I do think uh, reading is, is also really um, important. I mean, I know many people have read um, The New Jim Crow and it's really opened people's eyes to, to the system. But I think reading and also getting as proximate as you can to um, the problems and, and sometimes doing you know, very uncomfortable things. So you get to Owen McIntosh's question that comes after you. It's just been, it's been said that the current U.S. legal system is basically just an excuse to exploit the 13th Amendment since it allows involuntary servitude as punishment for a crime. What are your thoughts on that? You, you open the door. You started there already, but with the new Jim Crow. Yeah. No, I mean, I think, I mean, I think there's been a whole you know, documentary on the 13th Amendment and, and, um, and the, the implications of that. But I mean, I think it's, it's definitely something that, um, that I, I agree with. I think when we, and I think the great thing about the new Jim Crow is it makes the connections, right, between the historical, um, you know, infliction of punishment that's been put on black people in, in this country and tries to bring that uh, and I think I touched on this a bit about the same sort of discrimination, uh, discriminatory policies that are connected to incarceration. Um, but we know, for example, that in prisons across this country, for example, 
Um, there are folks working, you know, for 25 cents an hour, if that. Um, we know that, um, you know, one of the things that the Philly Bail Fund's been doing is actually looking at all the settlements in our jails, right? Um, you know, cases that, um, where there's been enormous harm done to people. Um, and I think what's interesting um, is that and what I think is even more frightening is, right, we don't have an iPhone for people to see that, right? It's, uh, it's you know, brutality that's done that can't be seen. Um, and so I think that makes it even more uh, troubling. But um, I think if there's anyone who has been uh, in prison or has visited, um, I think ultimately um, one can see the no violence that it is, but I think I'll, I'll also say that um, even if one believes, right, that, you know, there are certain people that, that need to, to go to prison, which is, um, I think, ultimately, all those people are going to, or not all of them, but a good amount of those people are going to come back in society. And so I think we all have to be interested in what happens there, um, because if people are exposed to enormous violence, if people are deprived of opportunities as a result of being um, incarcerated, um, then we're not actually getting anywhere. I think we're actually making people worse off. I guess there are two questions. Uh, one is how exactly the uh, current Black Lives Matter movement has really affected your work. And the second would be how has COVID affected uh, the bail reform movement? Looks like, is that from Nick Ricciardi? Nick, Nick has a question there. Did you, yeah. your classmate, you can see that. Classmate of mine. <laughs> so um, Nick asked, and uh, we'll go to him. Um, yeah. In your opinion, has Black Lives Matter movement been a turning point for transparency and positive change in regards to bail reform? And if not, what do you think must be done to bring awareness to this issue, which may not be on people's radars yet? You know, the past, couple months uh, since the death of George Floyd have just been um, a real whirlwind for the bail fund and the bail fund movement, right? So we provided bail assistance uh, to a good amount of um, uh, protests, uh, protesters. Um, but I think the general movement, Black Lives Matters movement, um, I think has been important because I think with, you know, and there's been a lot of discussions about defund the police and all those things, um, which a lot of people get caught up in. Um, but ultimately, I think it's about trying to reimagine the world we're in and trying to reimagine what public safety looks like, uh, trying to reimagine what community investment looks like. Um, and I think people have turned to bail funds, not only because, you know, we've been bailing out a lot of protesters, but if you think about it, you know, a bail fund, like we're not waiting for the system to do something, right? We're actively working toward building a world that, that doesn't exist yet. Um, and so I think, um, you know, we've gotten a lot of support uh, in recent months. And I happen to think it's because we're trying to, we're actively working toward, toward um, a, more, a more just society. And I think we're disrupting that status quo person at a time that we bail out. Uh, still, Kearns asked part of the question I was going. She asked the same thing. Do you believe COVID-19 has had an effect on people's views on bail? Are they thinking about it enough? Um, more support for getting rid of bail because of it? Or just a temporary change? Yeah, I think one of the things that, the, that COVID has revealed, I mean, it's been revealing in, in several ways. But one is I think it's revealed, you know, in many ways, the, the sham of the system that we're in. So for example, in Philadelphia, um, the same charge that Dante was arrested for during COVID, they just said that that's actually not an essential arrest. Like we're not gonna arrest on like drug possession charges because there's like a daily virus in the jail and like, it's just not essential. And it's just amazing to me that, you know, this is probably what many people uh, have been saying for years, but it took COVID for us to finally realize that actually, you know, arresting people who we believe have some drugs or alleged to have some drugs isn't probably the best use of, of, uh, of resources. 
Um, and in Philadelphia, uh, we've also had changes to the bail system. Um, so um, we're still trying to assess whether or not they've had any impact. But I think it's opened up a lot more conversation. I think it's radicalized more people to um, changing the system and being aware of bail. Um, but what I find very interesting, though, um, is that, you know, we in Philadelphia were holding a lot of protests and, and, and marches to try to get the city to release folks from jail. Um, and we got a lot of donations. Um, but it wasn't until the George Floyd incident that we saw a huge spike in donations, right? And so I just think it's interesting because here there was a, a moment when we were saying, you know, in Philadelphia, we had a death, two deaths in the jail. where We were saying, you know, people are dying in the jail. Um, but it took this other whole incident um, to really get the movement and, and interest in, in the donations. And so I think in many ways, COVID has exposed the system um, for, for what it is. But I think it also has um, exposed, in a sense, us and what we value and who we value. Um, because it had some decline in jail population, but nowhere near where it needed to be to really protect people's lives um, who are incarcerated. Uh, Professor Ellen Perry asks a question. She read that the Minnesota Freedom Fund received a lot of money and donations, so much so that they have to figure out how to scale up their work. Um, I'd mentioned, I guess, your fund went from, what, $165,000 a couple of years ago when you were doing small mailings to $3 million and you have enough money. Her question is, um, are there particular bail funds where donations are more needed now? Yeah, so we've actually, I mean, we're still getting donations, but, you know, we actually ask people to donate to a number of other organizations in Philadelphia. Um, yeah, I mean, there are about 46, perhaps 50 bail funds in the, around the country. Um, I think uh, there are a number of bail funds um, that are in need of support. I don't have them offhand now, but I can certainly send off the list. But there have been some like our bail fund and other bail funds, uh, certainly Minnesota bail fund that receive a lot of resources. But I think ultimately for us, I mean, we bailed out a lot of, um, you know, uh, people were uh, connected to the protest, but ultimately, you know, um, we're hoping, we've always had this goal of ending cash bail with the amount of resources we have now. I think we could think bigger and larger about how we reach that. Um, Cause I often say that, you know, our goal is to really work every day to make sure we don't need to exist. Um, and so I think the amount of funds we receive will hopefully allow us to, to be bolder and, and reaching that goal. But yeah, there are a lot of bail funds across the country um, and I'm happy to follow up with some that are in particular need of assistance. Uh, Nick Powers, your classmate asks, um, how your organization promotes advocacy and awareness aside from the, the frontline work that you're doing? Uh, it's clear this is not a niche political issue, but a question of common good for people on all sides of the political aisle. Uh, would you be willing to come and speak or Zoom at the school he teaches at in, in New York City? So we'll let you get back to Nicholas about that, whether you come and do that. But uh, we'll say to the question, how do, you, um, um, how do you apply political pressure on this? Yeah, and yeah, Nick's another classmate. I'm happy to come. Um, I think one of the things that I think the question was for how do we promote, how do we do advocacy? Yeah, uh, how do you change, how do you make that public change rather than uh, the front lines intervention, which can always be like putting your finger on a dike? Yeah, and that's a very good question because that's ultimately our goal, right? Um, so we do a number of things. As I mentioned, we run a court watch program where we actually, you know, we think public awareness on bail is very important. And so we have a portal where we can, folks can see the amount of bail set uh, in Philadelphia. Um, one of the things we also look at is, you know, if someone, for example, is appointed a public defender, it means that they're unable to afford to pay an attorney because they're indigent. So one of the things we also track is sort of how many people are assigned a public defender who are assigned bail. So I think broader public awareness is something that's really important. But I ultimately think um, that this is ultimately a matter of, of 
changing hearts and, and doing that sort of larger narrative work. And so one of the things we've really been trying to do, in addition to meeting with local politicians here, is to really try to center and uplift um, the experiences and stories of people we bailed out. And so this Martin Luther King Day, for example, we had a powerful, what we call a people's hearing, where we had people we bailed out um, share their stories. It was a people's hearing because all the politicians were there just to listen. Like they weren't, I think we allowed them to talk for a little bit at the end. Um, but the idea was sort of reshifting it to say, you know, this is what the, the people want and this is sort of the people's hearing for you to hear from them. Um, and I think ultimately, at least in my opinion, um, in addition to sort of the data and the meeting with politicians and, and political leaders, I think it's ultimately that sort of larger narrative work, right? For people to look at Dante as Dante, not the charges, which is what the system looks at. And I think um, I found that in, in push and change, that's ultimately, I think, um, what convinces people. Um, and it's what the system doesn't look at when it assigns bail, of course. I have a question from Kimberly McCullen. How do you decide what individuals receive bail assistance? Yeah. So um, we have a pretty, um, things are changing now. Like as you said before, we were a pretty small fund, uh, completely volunteer run. Um, and so we ultimately look at a few things. I mean, one, is whether or not the person can afford it, uh, of course. Um, and we also, um, because at one point we had limited funds, we had sort of an amount that we wouldn't pay over. Um, and so um, we would use that. Um, and then we would try to make some contact with family and those things to make sure the person that we were releasing would have some type of infrastructure upon release. Um, so, I mean, those are the real eliminating factors in terms of the amount that the bail is. Um, and so at one point we weren't paying over $5,000, um, but we deliberately have a pretty broad criteria only because we believe generally in the presumption of innocence and people being innocent proven guilty. Of course, with a limited amount, you know, you're probably not gonna hit certain charges, um, but for us, it's the amount not necessarily the charge that would distinguish whether or not we post bail. Um, I want to ask you one other question before we go, but maybe uh, Malik, I'll ask both of you and Dante, your, your friend and mentor, Professor Schmaltz, uh, wants to know a little bit more how you imagine the criminal justice system differently. What does it look like? Of course, Professor Schmaltz would ask the most, uh, you know, thought provoking question. Um, not that other people's questions were thought broken, but I'm just thinking about that sort of broad question um, and complex question. Um, you know, I don't know if this is limited to the criminal justice system, right? But, you know, I recently uh, visited a friend um, in the suburbs of Philadelphia. Um, for dinner. One of the things that was really interesting to me, you know, we talk about the whether or not we need more police, whether, you know, what we use them for. Um, but one of the things that I found interesting was when I was visiting my friend, that there was a drastic difference between where I lived and where she lives, right? One of the drastic differences, for me at least, was I saw virtually no police where she lived. Um, I kept asking myself, you know, why is that, right? Why in the suburbs of Philadelphia, there's no police, but, you know, in Philadelphia where I live, there's an enormous amount of police. Um, and I mean, one obviously could mention crime, but I think I'm trying to get deeper into sort of why is that, right? And I think ultimately to me, um, the communities that are the safest in our country are not the ones necessarily with the most police, but it's actually the ones with the most resources in my view. Um, and so I think with this movement that's going on now is saying, you know, how can we invest in communities to actually promote public safety? Um, you know, because we know that if you are deprived of opportunities, 
if you have lack of unemployment, if your kids can't go to quality schools. I mean, I think these are all um, factors that lead to crime. Um, and so for me, I think I envision uh, a world, um, a country that actually provided those resources in an equitable way, that provided care to people. Um, and because um, I ultimately think, I mean, as I said earlier, um, that the, what, what we've been doing so far, I think, is clearly not working. Um, and so I think if we were to actually invest in our communities and our most neglected communities, I actually happen to think and not rely just not rely on the criminal legal system. I actually think we would have a much safer, safer community um, uh, and, and world, I think. I'll just say, um, you know, kind of jaded and. Sometimes it becomes a little hard for me to even envision change, you know, going through some of the things I've been through in my life. But, you know, like, one thing I, I think, though, a lot of change from unfortunate memory. And, um, you know, when I think about crime, you know, a lot of that stems from, you know, economic disparity. You know, you have people selling drugs that leads to prostitution, that leads to that. And a lot of those things come from people don't want to be poor, right? And they don't see other ways that puts them with people. But so they do things to get to where they want to get to the way they know how to get to where they want to get to. And, like, I'll just say, like, there's a couple moments in my life that were, like, where, like good or bad. Like, I, I can think of 9 11 where, like, that was a moment when, like, I didn't see black or white. Like, it's everybody, like, you know, just, it's a break. And then I think about, you know, Obama being elected, where that was another moment where I didn't see black or white. You know, it was just, people were hacked. Some people. And I think about this moment now. I look and I see as many white Asian people, as I see black people, all trying to see the same change. And, you know, it, it's, it's just going to have to be a time when, like, you know, equal opportunity has to come to everybody. And, 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 and until that happens, you're going to always have that spirit that, that leads to, like, all these bigger problems. And so, like, you know, I don't know when that's going to happen, but, you know, I... I I envision that happening before I, all other problems start to become less of a problem. Malik, maybe to close, we're, we're right at closing time, but for the students, some advice, if you were back on the hill again, you're wearing purple or now, if you were back on the hill again, what, what helped you get to where you are and what would you tell them to do uh, to focus on? Yeah, I think before I get into that, I just want to say that, you know, there's a great group uh, that, you know, we very, very close with the Massachusetts Bail Fund that posts bail all across the state of Massachusetts. Um, and I was talking with someone from the bail fund today and actually Worcester is probably the most, uh, where a lot of the bail happens in the state. Um, interestingly, I didn't know that. Um, yeah, I often struggle with this question because I don't think I have it figured out at all. Um, I think if I were back at Holy Cross, or if I were to give any sort of advice, I mean, I think it would be to consistently, um, and I had this a lot in my courses with uh, Professor Schmaltz, and, you know, he constantly challenges me, um, is just to con continue to interrogate yourself and your surroundings, I guess, you know. Um, you know, for example, you know, and I think getting to sort of larger questions, right? So if, for example, every Thursday you're going to a soup kitchen, I think, which is important work, I think asking yourself why you have to do that or why we live in a society where that has to, where we need that, particularly in the richest country in the world. Um, I think also right now we live in this um, moment, right, where people are, want to keep their options open, you know, 
not really commit to, to something. Um, and I think me, I'm still, you know, young. Um, I found that actually committing to something is probably in a strange way, like tying yourself to something is probably has made me at least uh, freer than I've ever been in a way. And I'm not talking, I'm talking about freedom and I guess in the figurative sense, but you know, by tying yourself either, you know, to a person in terms of marriage or to a community or a cause, I think that's ultimately how one, you know, gets joy and, and, and happiness in life. Um, but I think I would urge all students to, to get as proximate as they can to the, to, to the suffering around them and, and do uncomfortable things. Um, and yeah, I'm, as I look back and we were talking about this earlier, Tom, um, I think the liberal arts for me was incredibly important. There was no criminology courses at Holy Cross, but the idea to interrogate, take an argument, pick it apart, come up with rebuttals, um, but also just reading, um, I think was also really important. So um, I'm sure there are many professors on here from different departments, but I'm, I'm going to make a push for the history department as well as something that folks can, uh, can look into. But yeah, I'm sure I'm rambling now, but I think those are my- No, you're doing great. And there are a lot of historians on there. So I, I can picture, uh, picture them all being happy about that. So- we get nasty emails from political science people. Well, thank you very much, uh, Malik. That's really been uh, eye-opening, even for me, having read about this, and uh, Dante as well for uh, uh, sharing firsthand uh, the experiences that you have, and uh, both of you for, I think, um, helping us to see um, a real traumatic problem that absolutely needs to be changed, but also, uh, I think, for providing us some hope and some real uh, mechanisms for, for making that change, for not just feeling uh, hopeless about that. So. Anyway, I'm grateful to uh, both of you and thank you to everyone who signed up to be with us.